Hey everybody, welcome back. Session 15 of our 20 for 2020 in 2020. So we're taking 20 looks at the book of Revelation for 2020 vision, for clarity, for forward vision, not hindsight looking back, but 2020 vision looking forward in the year of 2020. So I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We are on session 15 out of 20. If you've missed any of the first 14 sessions, you can find all of them on our website at whitestonechurchtx.com, on our YouTube channel, Whitestone Church TX, uh, and you can go under 20 for 20 and you can catch up if, if you miss anything. Tonight's going to be an exciting night. We're in chapter 17 of Revelation. We are uh, allowing God to reveal Jesus the Christ to us. And so as we get started tonight, we're going to pray and we're going to move quickly because we've got a lot of territory to cover. But I just want to remind you that God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose for you. And it's my honor to, to share this with you tonight. And God is good all the time. God has got something for us. And so as we go through tonight's lesson or look, I really want you to have your Bible, paper, and a pen. I want you to really allow God to speak to the inside man or woman, to speak to your heart. And if I say some things that you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? Just allow God to, to, um, allow God to speak to you. And just because I say it doesn't mean it's fact, doesn't mean it's true. But God is going to speak to you through whatever words he says to you tonight. Can I get an amen? So Father God, we love you. And God, we bless you. And God, we declare that you are the king of all kings. And that you are the Lord of all lords. And we declare the name Jesus as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world, the Redeemer, our hope. And God, we declare that you are holy in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. We're going to pick back up uh, and recap chapter 16. Chapter 16 we left off last night, or last session, with the bowls. These are the wrath of God coming to the earth. These bowls will be poured out during the last three and a half years of the tribulation, and the world will experience the wrath of God like never before. The Bible says that God doesn't bring his wrath to, uh, to judge us out of anger, but out of righteousness. So when we read these bowls of wrath, let's not think, oh, God's angry, God's mad at us. No, no, no. God is bringing righteous judgment to the earth. And so when we look at the bowls, the bowl judgment, um, on your notes, I forgot to say this, we do have notes for every session. If you'd like a copy of them, go to our website, whitestonechurchtx.com. Go to the drop down, contact us, give us your name, your, your email, we'll send them to you. Uh, but in your notes, we'll have a recap of the first seven bowls of judgment, or these seven bowls of judgment. The first one is the bowl is poured out on the earth. I think that's a clarity to bring up. And it's poured out on people that have the mark of the beast. These people have already chose to reject God and follow Satan. And so this is a, this is a judgment of boils or sores. It's the sixth plague that was brought to Egypt back when Moses faced Pharaoh. The second bowl judgment is on the sea, and it's a judgment against the earth. And the and the the sea there could very well be the Mediterranean Sea, which is the which is in uh, the border of Israel and and there in the Middle East. It could mean the entire oceans. I don't I'm not sure, but they're turned to blood, and that's the first plague listed in Egypt. Uh, the first Egyptian plague. The sec the third bowl is the bowl on water. And the water is turned to blood. Again, the first plague of Egypt. Uh, then the next four are interesting because God is rebuking Satan. So he's judging the earth and mankind in the first three. But the next four are against Satan and against his system. So just look at the subtlety of, of what happens. Bowl number four is poured out on the sun. Now the reason that is is because there's a sun worship. The worship of the sun was created, the first pagan religion created by Satan. And that worship still takes place today. Satan wants to be worshipped, but the first judgment is poured out on the sun as a response to the worship of the sun 
or to the worship of something created versus the creator. Um, the fifth bowl is on the throne of the beast. He literally destroys the very place where Satan sits and darkness comes across the earth. And that darkness we talked about last night is not just the absence of illuminated light. It's the absence of Jesus, the light. It's the absence of anything that's holy, anything that's good. And this absolutely wrecks havoc on mankind who's following the beast. That is also the ninth plague in the plagues of Egypt. The sixth one is the is the bowl on the Euphrates River. And this is a, a judgment against uh, the river itself and against the barrier between um, God's wrath and Israel. And that's a demonic army flows into Israel to destroy it at the Battle of Armageddon or to invade it at the Battle of Armageddon. The seventh one is, is a cool one. It's the bowl that's poured out into the air and it is a destruction of Babylon. It's the last plague, but it's also a destruction of Satan who's called the Prince of the Air. So as you look at those seven bowls of judgment, they're not just these things that are going to happen. They have great intentionality to them. So that's going to take us to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, we're introduced to the great harlot. So grab your Bible, and we'll read a couple of these verses in just a minute. But I want to I read the first uh, five verses of chapter 17. Then we're going to look at an Old Testament reference to this. So turn to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 with me. The great harlot. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. That word waters just means her, her influence is global. It's, it's all across the land. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, a dry or deserted place, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination, and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations on the earth. So this harlot is the false prophet religious system. This harlot is not a person per se, but it is a system. It is a, a um, religious system that is con uh, compared to a whore or a harlot because of its infidelity towards the one true God, because it seeks a lesser lover, a lover that can't satisfy instead of the lover that pursues our soul, Jesus Christ. So I want to take us to the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 5 for a very interesting prophecy about this great harlot, about this system, this religious system that is propagated by the false prophet. Now, before we read Zechariah, I want to say this about this harlot system. It's already here. It's already here. We've talked about the book of Revelation time after time being a panoramic view of things that have happened, things that are happening, and things that will happen. So when we look at this false prophet system of religion, we will see that it is goes all the way back to its infancy at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 10. It goes all the way back to the garden in Genesis 3 where Satan tempts Adam and Eve to question the authority of God, to question the um, mandate or commandments of God. So we see that in its infancy, it's rooted out of, out of Satan himself, but we'll, we'll trace this back to how it took root in the governmental system all the way back to Babel. So we'll look backwards at how this great harlot <clears throat> has committed adultery towards God, has influenced people to drink 
the wine of her fornication. In other words, to go, oh, that's so good, that's so good. And we see, we'll look at how it is propagating today, and that's where you and I have really got to pay attention. And then we'll see how it can or will produce or manifest in the future. So let me say this when it comes to um, false religion. <clears throat> false religions are anything outside of worshiping Jehovah God, Jesus Christ. False religion is anything other than what God the Creator, the God of the Bible, tells us to do. Anything added to the Word of God is an abomination, and anything taken away from the Word of God is an abomination. So when we're looking at this pattern through history, and we're looking at it today, and we look at it with 2020 vision into the future, let us break it down to this simple fact. If God didn't say it, and if God didn't approve it, then it is false religion. It is a false gospel. It's an it's a idol, and it is a worshiping of something other than the Creator, Jehovah God. So <clears throat> let's look at, at Zechariah chapter 5, and let's just look at the prophecy that Zechariah, this prophet, spoke about this beast system. So turn in your Old Testament to the book of Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. <clears throat> then the angel who talked to me, talked with me, came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. Now that word go, goes forth means in the day of Zechariah, it was already moving. It was already headed towards a trajectory. It was already headed towards a point in time. So this thing that goes forth isn't something, this false religion isn't something that Satan's just going to bring out of the blue one day. It's already on its way. It's already taking thousands and millions of people to hell with it. So I asked, what is this? And God responds, or the angel responds, it is a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. So this has a global resemblance so when we look at false religion tonight, and that's where we're really going to zero in, when we look at false religion, you'll see a, res a resemblance of Satan's fingerprint in all world religions. You'll see a resemblance of the rebellion towards simply what the Bible says. You'll see a resemblance that every other religion on the planet other than Christianity, the following of Jesus Christ, you'll see an ideology that has great resemblance to that of the serpent's theology in the garden. Did God really say that? I don't think God said that. I know that's what's written in the Bible, but that's not really what God meant. Did God really say that? See, the enemy just wants us to question this much. Did God really mean it when he wrote that? Ah, uh, he meant it for them, but not you today. We're too sophisticated. Culturally, that doesn't work for us anymore. Ah, that's old thought. That's old school. We have this new revelation. We have these new prophecies. No, if God said it, he meant it. So when we look back, let's go back to Zechariah 5. This is their resemblance throughout the earth. Verse 7. Here is a lead disc lifted up, or the lid. Here's the lid lifted up off of the basket. So this basket had a lid on it. It had, you know, like a, a woven basket with a lid, and you're going to take something in it. He lifts up the lid, and there is a woman sitting inside the basket. Now, if you just read this in Zechariah, you'd be going, what in the heck are they talking about? He lifts up the lid, and there's a woman inside the basket. Now, we've got to remember that terminology. Then he said, this is wickedness, pointing to the woman. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, 
and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. So this basket with a woman inside of it is lifted up and, and the angel shows Zechariah the wickedness. He puts the lid back on and these two angels or these two um, uh, uh, women coming with wings like a stork pick this up and take it between heaven and earth. Satan is the prince of the air. Satan is the prince of the air. He was the chief musician in heaven. His job was to glorify God so he would make music. Music is airwaves. He's the prince of the air. That's what it's saying. A lot of times when God says something, Satan will go, did God really say that? See, it's not did God really write that, but is that really what he said? See, there's a difference in reading the word of God and taking it for what it says, believing the word of God. So when God says something to you, Satan many times comes back with his little voice and says, God didn't really say that to you. So he questions what's in the air. So this basket is lifted up into the air. Verse 10. So I said to the angel who talked to me, now listen to this, this is so prophetic. It's, this is a deep, deep passage. So he said to the angel who talked to me, Why, where are they carrying the basket? The basket, let me just give a little reference. The basket represents the kingdom or the city or the government of the Antichrist. This is Satan's kingdom. The basket represents the entity of the kingdom. The woman represents the harlotry or the fornication of worshiping false gods so the question so i asked the angels so zachariah says to the angel where are they carrying the basket and the angel said to to zachariah to build a house for it in the land of shinar now that's huge if we're just reading the bible and we don't under, understand the bible we'll just read right by that to build a house for it to build a foundation for it, to build walls for it, to build a structure for it, to build a territory. If you build a house, you have to buy a piece of land. You've got to mark out your four corners. You've got to put your base down. You've got to prep the land. You've got to work the ground so the land will be hardened for the foundation of the house. This city they're building is a territory that Satan is claiming as his own. He's marked off the four corners. He's working the soil, the hearts of man, the soil, and he's hardening it so he could build his foundation so that then he could build the structure of his kingdom on. Now, this will all be physical activity of real brick and mortar, but remember the Antichrist system is already invading hearts, and that is the key. That If we don't take anything out of Revelation... Take to it, God, what's my heart? Is, is the Antichrist building his kingdom in my heart? Is the Antichrist building his kingdom in my mind, my thought process? Is the Antichrist able to, to set up a house inside of me? It says they're going to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. Now that's not just coincidental. Where did Nimrod build the Tower of Babel? In the plains of Shinar. This is demonic territory. This is demonic territory. Where is the Garden of Eden? Somewhere on earth. Oh, really? No, I think the Garden of Eden's in outer space somewhere. No. The Garden of Eden is on earth. There is an entrance to the Garden of Eden that an angel has posted and we can't get into it. We'll never find it. There is a gate to the bottomless pit. There is a access to the depths of hell on this earth. That's what our Bible teaches us. Evolution wants us to believe that our earth is like, we got 2,500 other options out there in the, in the atmosphere, in the universe. We're just one of billions. We're not really special. We just evolved. We're just this little dot on the map. And, and God forbid there's 2,500 other earths out there we could have, we could have uh, bubbled up out of the cosmic uh, soup and gone to the zoo, and then we could have had you. We could have done that anywhere. That's, those are lies from the pit of hell. That's Darwinism. That's 
Gnosticism, that is atheism, that's scientism to the core. There's a real place on this earth that's a gate to Eden. There's a real place on this earth because your Bible tells you that the angel that descends from heaven will be given the key to the bottomless pit and out of the pit will come smoke that will cover the planet. It is a physical place. So the land of Shinar is Satan's territory. And he's going to build his kingdom there. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. The basket is this one world false religion. It is the system that's coming. And inside of it is the false prophet, the woman, the harlot. Now the system itself is called the harlot. But so is the person, the, anti the false prophet, beast. That person, the false prophet, will be the harlot that leads the world to bowing down to demons, bowing down to false gods. We have to grasp this concept. So Zechariah 5, read it on your own. It is great insight to what Revelation 17 is talking about. The prophet Zechariah here is a, a reference to preachers and men and women that claim to be Christians to announce truth. Days are over where we're sugarcoating, politically correct, going to uh, dumb down the gospel. Those days are over. Those days are over. It's time to preach the gospel. It's time to speak it for what it is, to tell it like it is, in a way that God would say it. Can I get an amen? Um, when he announces that this is wickedness, he's saying this is witchcraft, this is perversion, this is vile, this is demonic, this is unholy. So go back to Revelation 17. Here's the great harlot being manifest. Now, go down to verse 5 in your Bible where it says, And the name on her forehead was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots there is plural. It's a brothel. It's a house full of prostitution. It's a plethora of options. What Satan wants you to see is that, hey, Jesus, man, he's just one of a hundred options to the real God the Father. Hey, Jesus, you, you know, Christians, y'all, you, your problem as Christians is you just say that nobody else has the right way. No, we didn't say it. Jesus said it. I'm the way, the way, the way, not a way, the truth, not a truth, and the life, not a life. He, he, Jesus says it's Yahweh, it's my way. The mother of harlots in this statement is a plethora of God options. The scarlet beast is the false prophet. It's the one world religion. The scarlet beast will ride the Antichrist beast system. See, the Antichrist will be the world ruler from a governmental level. And he will lead the world into domination for Satan's agenda. But the false prophet will be equal to him in getting the world to worship Satan. Satan is not satisfied with just world domination similar to Hitler or Alexander the Great or Nero or one of the Caesars in Rome. They wanted worldwide domination and they did quote unquote want people to worship them, but but they didn't necessarily say that they were God. This Antichrist is not going to be just okay with worldwide domination. He wants people to worship them. That's why he has a false prophet as his right-hand man, as his second in charge. Babylon is the great city. It's the kings, the merchants, the commerce. Harlotry means this, false devotion. A prostitute will, will play false devotion to somebody for a limited amount of time, for a price. Harlotry flatters. It pretends affection. Pornography is destroying a mass amount of minds in our world today. And it's teaching us how to have pretend affection. It's destroying marriages. It's destroying young people's idea of love and intimacy. And one of the roots of it is the destruction of pretend affection. 
Jerusalem slash Israel is likened to harlotry or committing adultery or harlotry in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 21 in the book of Hosea. If you've never read the book of Hosea, Francine Rivers wrote, wrote a great book called, um, I forgot the name of it all of a sudden, Redemption Love, I think. Uh, but she wrote a book on Hosea. The book of Hosea, read that in your Bible. It's, it, I think it's like 14 chapters long. It's a great story. It's a story that shocks you if you've never read it. And I won't spill the beans. But it's not a story of just Hosea and his harlot wife. It's a story of Israel. It's a story of you and I when we chase false lovers that pretend affection, pretend to love us, but they'll charge us and strip us of our dignity and our true worship. The color purple was the predominant color. Okay, so here we go. The color purple listed here was the predominant color of Roman imperialism. Scarlet is the col color of the Roman Catholic golden cup. So I'm fixing to get into Catholicism. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about different world religions in just a minute. So before I st start talking about Catholicism, let, let me just say this. Many of you watching have c Catholic backgrounds. You may have grown up Catholic or your family members are Catholic. I am not coming against people in the Catholic Church. I'm not going to speak against them. There are a lot of people who are Catholic who absolutely love Jesus Christ. But I will, I do want to say this. The system of Catholicism is twisted and corrupt. There is great blasphemy going on within that system. Whether all the people agree with that or not is subject to um, individual um, experience. But... The system itself is corrupt to the core. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about some other religions. We're going to talk about religions or groups that you may have been a part of. I'm not attacking you. I'm not attacking your loved ones that may be members of these groups or grew up in this, in this cult or this religion. What I'm saying is you've got to look at the core beliefs of these systems and say, does it line up with Scripture? And if it doesn't, is it committing adultery? Is it a harlot? Is it an abomination before God? So the color purple here, when John writes about purple, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Roman, Rome, when this was written, purple was the predominant color of, of the Roman Empire. The scarlet color is, is the adopted color of the golden cup that is used in Catholicism today. Abominations means idolatry. Blasphemy is any doctrine. Hear this. Blasphemy is any doctrine that attempts to add or subtract from the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's an abomination. Or that's blasphemy. Salvation by works denies God's glory and, is sal and it's salvation by grace. So I want to bring up some things that the Roman Catholic Church teaches. And again, I'm not attacking people, but I am saying you have to look at the system and what's the core behind it. So when we look at this harlotry system, there's a great book by uh, Dave Hunt called The Woman Who Rides the Beast. I have not read it, so I'm not uh, um, you know, telling you everything in it is true, but I've heard a lot of interviews from him. And it's good reading material because it has good insight. I don't necessarily believe that the Pope is going to be the false prophet. I, I, can't, I can't bite that off and, and chew on that. I do believe, though, that Roman Catholicism will play a huge part of the false beast system because it's already bowing down to other world religions and accepting them as one. Again, I'm not attacking the people, but I am saying we've got to look at the system and the belief structure that, that teaches the people. So here, stay with me. If I lost you, forgive me. Stay with me. Roman Catholicism differs from the Bible in these six or seven, eight different ways. If you remember, uh, Martin Luther nails 95 problems that he had with the church, the Roman Catholic Church, on the door. And that started 
the Reformation or Protestants started all the different Protestant denominations that most of you watching worship in today. So we got to know where we came from and why. Here's a couple problems with the Catholic Church as a whole. The Catholic Church teaches that it is the only true church. And when I say church, they mean they are the only true denomination of Christianity. So if you are part of a Baptist or Presbyterian or Lutheran or Pentecostal, then you don't belong to the true church. That's not biblical. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that they are infallible. That anything they do or say cannot be wrong. Okay. Um, I think the last time I checked, everybody part of the Roman Catholic Church are men and women uh, who make mistakes. So, uh, the only the Roman Catholic Church has the authority to interpret Scripture. This is one of the big things on your King James Bible. When King James wanted the, the English people to have the Bible, the Roman Catholic Church went to war against people that owned Bibles. Tyndale, all these different men in the past that owned and printed Bibles, the Catholic Church warred against them because they said, you're too dumb, you're too ignorant to understand Scripture. Well, that's the lie of the enemy. The Roman Catholic Church is not the only church that can interpret Scripture. The Holy Spirit is who interprets Scripture to us and through us. Now, we can't just run with our own interpretation. We have to measure that against the entirety of the Word of God. But one of the fallacies of the Catholic Church is that they are the only one that can uh, interpret Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Pope is the head of the church and has the authority of Christ. Now that word Christ there doesn't say Jesus, but the Christ Spirit. So the Pope and the Catholic Church would teach that the Pope is the embodiment, the physical embodiment of the Christ Spirit. No, the Pope is a man. He's not God. He's fallible. He's not perfect. He has to repent like any of the rest of us. The Catholic Church would teach that you can only get saved through the Catholic catechisms or the Catholic Church uh, mandate of functions of the gospel. Um, that their sacred tradition is equal to Scripture. No, it's not. Um, forgiveness of sin uh, and the forgiveness of sin and salvation is by faith and works. That goes directly against Ephesians where it says, we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't get to, you don't get salvation through penance. You don't get salvation through works. You get salvation through grace, but you're saved to then go do works. The Catholic Church um, uh, teaches to pray to Mother Mary and to saints. We are not to pray to the dead. Nowhere in Scripture do we pray to the dead. We only pray and worship the one living God, Jesus the Christ. Every angel in Scripture, when, when Daniel or, or uh, John or different men saw angels in the Bible, they fell down to worship them. And those angels, every time, with the exception when Jesus shows up and, and Joshua thinks he's the angel, when, when, every time they say, don't worship me worship God. We do not pray to Mother Mary. Mother Mary does not go to Jesus on our behalf. We have priest, we are priests and kings. We have direct access to God. We do not have to confess our sins to a priest. We do not have to confess our sins or pray to Mother Mary to pray to Jesus for us. That's blasphemy. Mary is not a virgin birth person, Mary had to repent and follow Jesus Christ just as the rest of us. And some of you are, maybe your face is turning red right now. I'm not attacking you. And I'm not, I'm not attacking, I'm just stating that is not biblical. You cannot find that in the Bible. Purgatory is taught by the Catholic Church. You don't pray souls out of purgatory. There's no limbo between heaven and hell. You make that choice on earth. Each person makes themselves. Purgatory was a trick from the Catholic Church to get money from people. 
hey, your loved one died, bring us money, bring us an offering, and we'll pray them out of purgatory. It's, it, is, it is blasphemy, and it's not true. Um, substantiation is the belief that the communion bread and wine turn into the physical body and the physical blood of Jesus Christ. That's still taught by Roman Catholicism. It was used to control people and truly to control ignorant people. So thank God for King James who gave us the Bible in English because before that, the Roman Catholic Church did all the interpretation. And that's the breakthrough of the Reformation of Protestants uh, and, and the belief that we have direct access to God. So again, I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking, and I'm not attacking, but I am just stating these are the fallacies with the Roman Catholic Church. When it says hidden mysteries, um, or it says mysteries on the harlot, the first word there says mystery. Um, it says, let me, let me read it one more time. It says mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Listen, I'm going to hit home on a couple things here, but you're just going to have to stay with me. Um, there is no religion, there are no secret societies, there are no secret names for God. Let me say it again. There are no names for God that are not listed in the Bible. If there is a name for God listed in the Bible, then we may use it. But if there is not a name listed in the Bible for God, it didn't come from God. It is from Satan. It originated from the Tower of Babel or the Garden with the Serpent. Now hear me, there are a lot of hidden secret societies. And these secret societies will say, we have the true name for God. Come in and we'll teach you the true name for God. Come into our system and through certain levels and through certain rights and through certain um, uh, you know initiations and and after so many levels of, of, of theology and classrooms and so much money we'll teach you the real name of God at the core that's Luc luciferianism at the core that is Lucifer worship now you got to hear this this is the beast system today it's here. It was here long before you and I were born. It's here today, and it will be here after us. But this is what fools the world, and it's already fooling the world. So here, stay with me. Masonry is one of the largest um, secret societies in the world. Teach its subordinates and teach its initiates that they have the real name to God. <clears throat> so they would call God the grand architect of the universe. That's not in the Bible. That name's not in the Bible. That is a canopy deity name. When they say in masonry that God's name is really the grand architect of the universe, what they really are saying is, hey, you just have to believe in a supreme being. You just have to believe in a higher power. Oh, you could call him Allah, and Allah would be the grand architect of the universe. You could call him uh, Buddha. You could call him Muhammad. You could call him uh, the tree in the backyard. You could even call him Jesus of the Bible. That's a great thing. No, that's not true. God is known by one name and one name alone. And his name is Jesus Christ. So we can't serve an all-inclusive God. That is a false deity. That is a God of itself. In masonry, they'll teach you that the real name of God is Jah, J-A-H-B-U-L-O-N, Jah Bulon. And that is a mixture of three deities of, uh, of, of paganism. The first one would not be paganism. The first one, Jah, is for Jehovah. J-A-H is listed in Psalms as Jah, meaning Jehovah, short for Jehovah. But in Masonry, they'll tell you that the name of God, the hidden secret name is Jah Buell, B-U-L, which is Baal, and then An, which is Osiris from the Egyptian gods. So they'll take three deities and melt them together and say, that's the real name of God. Now that's in the royal arc, uh, arch of Masonry in that level. And, and the point is, is that there's no secret names to God. God can't be Baal and Jehovah. 
the Bible says Baal is a false god. So you can't mix a false god with a real god and say, oh, it's the grand architect of the universe. It's not true. It's a false deity. It's a false religion. Oh, it's just a good society. No, no, no. At the core of it, I'm not saying the men and women involved in it are corrupt. I'm saying that the, the, the entity is corrupt. It is the worship of Lucifer at the core. Please don't turn me off. Stay with me. Mormonism. Mormonism is, is a false god. Joseph Smith alone said this. Listen to this quote from the father of Mormonism. God himself was once as we are now, an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. Joseph Smith claims that God was a man, just like us, and now he's been enthroned in yonder heavens. I'm going to tell you, the quote goes on to say, I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was from that God was God from all eternity. We have supposed, no, the Bible teaches us that. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. And I will take away the veil so that you may see that he was once a man like us. Yes, that God himself, the Father of us, dwelt on earth the same as Jesus Christ did. That's, that's a false gospel. Jehovah Witnesses claim that God, Jesus, is the archangel Michael. Angels are created. God's the creator. You can't have it both ways. Scientology. Some of our beloved actors and actresses. Scientology. Tom Cruise. Um, John Travolta. They, they buy into the Scientology. Scientology says God's name is Zenu. Let me read a statement, and you can't make this up, from L. Ron Hubbard himself, the founder of Scientology. Zenu, according to Scientology, is the dictator, the god, of a galactic confederacy, confederacy, confederacy who brought billions of his people to Earth in a DC-8-like spacecraft 75 million years ago stacked them around volcanoes, and killed them with hydrogen bombs. Officially, Scientology scripture holds that Thetans, immortal spirits, of these aliens adhere to humans causing spiritual harm. That's not made up. That's real stuff. People really believe it. They believe that God is a God named Xenu that comes from outer space and blows up his own people, and now we have to deal with these different Thetans, these immortals, that attach themselves to us, so we need to go through Scientology to get clear or clean. Hinduism, uh, Brahma, the Trinity, they have their own God, their own Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Their avatars are the manifestations of one supreme God. Buddhism, Buddhism seeks to reach a state of nirvana slash enlightenment, that there is no belief in a personal God, just a force. May the force be with you. Why wow, does that sound familiar? Oh, yeah, we entertain our kids with that all the time. That's, that is enlightenment, that you can't know God personally. He doesn't have a name. There's just a good versus bad force. There's just the yin versus the yang. There's just light versus darkness. <coughs> there is a God who's given us his name and wants to know us personally, and his name is Jesus Christ. Luciferianism is the belief that Lucifer is good, and worshipped as the true God. Paganism is witchcraft, magic, sorcery, cabal, shamanism. Just want you to be aware of some things. CBD oil is a big deal in our culture right now. And I'm not saying that the core CBD oil is bad. But when I drive down the street and I see the American shaman CBD oil, man, my spiritual body just goes ding, 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 ding. The American shaman, shamanism is paganism. Shamanism is a root from the Native Americans, and shamanism is sorcery, witchcraft, and, and so let's, not, let's make sure that what we buy and what we use has not been prayed over or blessed by somebody that's worshiping a pagan deity. And that's what that means, and we need to start waking up to this stuff. Sun worship is modern-day earth worship. Sun worship, we can look back and go, those stupid Egyptians worshiping the sun, raw God, are they, are they kidding me? It's just this big ball of gas that 
burning billions of light years away and blah, 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 blah. Sun worship today is earth worship. Earth worship. Earth worship is Darwinism. That the earth produced you. The earth produced you over billions of years. That's evolution Darwinism. That's sun worship. It's the same thing. We just put an educated 2020 American twist to it. Gnosticism and athe atheism. Listen, I hope you're still with me, but I just want you to see that this harlotry, this fornication, I could talk for a day on false religions. It is false if it did not originate from Jesus Christ. If it's if not the same gospel, it's not from God. Listen, I love people. And when I meet somebody that's involved in this, I don't beat them up. I don't yell at them. I just say, hey, tell me what you believe and why you believe it. And I always ask this one question. Hey, who's Jesus to you? Oh, he's a good guy. He's a good teacher, good rabbi, a good prophet. Yeah, I mean, he good morals, man, great morals. Uh, well, do you think he was God? No, 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 not God. No, not God. Well, why not? Well, because I, I worship God. I am God. Do you know what enlightenment means? To look inward. Oh, Cameron has the answer. Cameron has the reasoning. Oh, I just need to look inward and find myself. I have to leave you to find myself. Okay, what are you going to find in there? You're not going to find holiness. You're going to find whatever you say is right and whatever you think is gospel. This is the false prophet system. It's not he's going to create this new religion one day. It's just going to be anything and everything that's not holy or true. Are you still with me? I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Just think about how did 11 of the 12 disciples die. They took the gospel of Jesus Christ into other territories and for whatever reason it was they were killed for it now in America we're not killed for our beliefs our reputation may be our our you know our whatever we may be quote unquote killed in other ways but when this beast antichrist and this false prophet beast there will be a great slaughter against those who believe the gospel and I hear it all the time. Oh, pastor, I hope I'm here during that great tribulation because I'm going to... Man, if we won't do it today because we're in fear of losing our job or that girl won't go out with us anymore or that guy's going to break up with us if I just don't do what he wants me to do. And, and if I just really tell him what I believe, if we won't stand up today, why would we stand up later? Are you still there? Look at verse 7. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman that, and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Mark that down. And go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Out of the pit is not simply a revival or a joining of earthly empires, but a supernatural revival of demonic, demonic empires or satanic empires. This will be something that comes out of the pit. It will be a religion that we haven't seen. It will be a force that we haven't seen that all the world's religion, it will be a doctrine. It, that's what it, it's going to be a doctrine that everybody goes, oh. Oh, that, that's what Jesus was saying. And, and the Muslim will say, Oh, that's what Muhammad, that's what the Quran's saying. And, and the Mormons will go, Oh, that's what Joseph Smith meant. And, and everybody in the world will go, That's, oh, that's what L. Ron Hubbard meant. Oh, yes. Finally. It'll be happy go lucky. Everybody bow down. But it won't be what Jesus said. 
You got to hear that. Um, the beast carries this woman, this religion, because governmental control is not the ultimate agenda for the Antichrist. The beast, look, l listen, we haven't got to this verse yet, but the beast will destroy the woman and the religion and reveal himself to be worshipped directly. No more veil of false demon idol, idol worship. Listen to this. Behind every idol is a demon, and behind every demon is Satan. Right now, Satan's fine if you worship idols and call them whatever name you want. But the day's coming in this Revelation chapter 17 where he will then murder and destroy the harlot, destroy the false prophet. He'll turn against that which got the world to turn, that fooled the world. And then he'll rip the veil off and say, you now must worship me. You must wor What Satan wants is worshiping him as God. He's not satisfied with you worshiping one of his underlings right now. Right now it's okay, but ultimately he's going to strip that away. Listen to what it says. Here's the mind of wisdom, verse 9. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Those mountains, we talked about them a couple sessions ago. Mountains of influence, kingdoms, influence, territories. There are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast was and that the, and is not is himself also the eighth and is and is of the seven that is going to perdition the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast this is this worldwide domination these are the kings of the earth who are going to join forces with the antichrist for a short time it says one hour that just means short time these are of one mind, but here's the kicker. They're one mind with the beast. These 10 leaders are one mind with the beast, and they will give their power and authority over to him. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome him, for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings, and those who are called with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he says to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This worldwide worshiping of the, of the Antichrist. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, that's the world leaders. Listen, here, here's what I'm trying to get to real quick. Verse 16. They will hate the harlot. On the surface, we love you, we love you. One world religion, yay! But internally, they'll hate it because of the power. So they will turn. Unfortunately, what happens with most prostitutions, most, most prostitutes, and what do we see? We see this love in the beginning, but then when it's over, this disgust and this hatred. That's what happens here. Those will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So the kings of the earth will turn and destroy. Why would they do that? Because they're in one mind with the beast. They now are no longer satisfied with this unified worship of demons. It's now let's worship Satan himself, the dragon. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be one mind, and to give their kingdoms to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Isaiah 8, chapter, 7, chapter 8, verse 7 says, now, therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria and all of his glory. He will go over, go over all of his channels and all of his banks. The enemy, the great city, can be strategically, will be strategic, strategically placed in the plain of Shinar, Babylon. And the kings of the earth will hate the harlot and its control of the false prophet. Listen, we know we, I know I said a lot, and I hope you're still with me. But I want to say this. What are we worshiping? What are we following? Are we just buying all these agendas of the enemy? Are we just buying, oh, yoga is good. It's just for physical workout. It's just good for... Okay. Look up the root of yoga. Where did yoga come from? It's Hinduism. And it's God worship. It's putting your physical body into a position to work, 
to worship a Hindu god. Oh, I, I don't do it for that reason. Okay. Well, why, why are we entertaining our kids with witchcraft and magic movies? Oh, well, it's just good entertainment. It came from Disney. That's good for us, isn't it? Disney's is a good place. I don't know. Are we already falling for the harlot? Are we already drinking of her fornication? Are we ourselves cheating on God? Cameron, you're, you're preaching tough stuff, man. You're just stripping me of all my fun. and You don't understand. My whole family's been part of this for generations. I'm not saying anything about your family. I'm not saying. I'm just saying it's time to be holy. I don't want us to miss God. I don't want us to miss heaven because some lure of Satan got us here on this earth. A lot of us worship money. That's our God. A lot of us worship our bodies. A lot of us worship our kids, our families, and we put them before God. Listen. The harlot system is here today. As Christians, we believe in one God, one truth, and one way. Jesus says, narrow is the gate. And here's the scary thing that he said. He says, broad is the road to destruction. And many will find that. But narrow is the gate which leads to life. And few find it. Jesus said, that's a mathematical term. Many and few. That's not 50-50. He didn't say half will find the pathway to hell and half will find the, the narrow way to heaven. No. Few. Why? Because we don't want to travel on the narrow road. We don't. We don't want the narrow road. We want the road of least resistance we want the road that makes us feel good. We want the theology that just tickles our ears and, oh, God loves me even though I'm doing all this sinful stuff. God loves me. He does. Doesn't mean he accepts and approves. God is love, but God's also righteous. And if Revelation teaches us anything, man, he is his judgment. I don't want to be deceived. And as I'm talking to you, you have to hear me. I struggle with everything I'm telling you. I like movies. I like jokes. I like my way. I like money. I like power. I like prestige. I, I like all these things. I want to believe all people go to heaven. I, I would love it if everybody died and went to heaven. But I can't believe that. Well, why not? Because the Bible says they don't. The Bible even gives us a parable of a rich man that's in hell begging for a drop of water. And Lazarus is, is in heaven. He's not in heaven because he was poor and the guy's there because he's rich. One just loved Jesus and one didn't. One followed God and one didn't. It's that simple. <clears throat> the beast system will be very attractive. <clears throat> but it's time that we need to sever some things. Listen, you've got to sever yourself from false religion. You need to throw some books away. You need to throw some paraphernalia away. You need to ask God to forgive you for joining. You need to, you need to cut ties. You need to take a stand, not against the people. We love the people. We just say, look, man, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. Well, why not? Well, you sound crazy, man. What? You got all religious and everything? No, I found Jesus. Ask yourself, have I committed adultery against God? Have I chased a lesser lover? And as a pastor, I have to say, oh, yeah. Yeah, dude, I have done that so many times. But every time I repent, God brings me back. 
Listen, if you're involved in the occult, get out. Just step out. I met a couple uh, a few months back. So proud of them. They got saved. And they left their occultic background. And they severed ties. Listen, if you're dabbling in magic, the craft, if you're dabbling in witchcraft, if you're dabbling in magic games and, and Pokemon and, and all these card games that, that are all about demons and, and you got these many points and this much power and, and all this stuff, and you got to get out of that. Oh, that, that's the only, only time I can connect with my kids. Well, duh, I wonder who's behind that, huh? Let's not subject our kids to things that will lead them one day, not to family time with mom or dad or, or their reading's going to go up. It's teaching them occult practice, occultic, demonic practice. Witchcraft is as rebellion. A lot of people say, well, why is my kid so rebellious? Because you've been teaching them witchcraft. Mom and dad, repent. Son and daughter, if mom and dad won't do it, throw it out yourself. It's time to clean house. It's time to get ready for the return of Christ. The beast, false Christ, false prophet system is already here. And it's so crept into the church. It's so crept into the camp. God says, if my people will repent and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways then I'll hear from heaven and I'll answer them and heal their land let's bring healing let's get ready for this thing let's not be blind any longer i hope during this 2020 for 20 this 20 for 2020 revelation bible study that that you may have be seeing things a little bit different. Next week, we'll be with you on Monday, 6.30. Um, next week, we'll, we'll have five more sessions. It'll be the end of our Revelation study. And we're going to talk about the, the great beast system. And the beast system is going to talk less about religious manipulation, but more about economic manipulation and governmental and educational manipulation. The beast system is already here. If we can't see due to this coronavirus that this is economic warfare against America, then we're blind. If we can't see the educational warfare against our children, then we don't want to see it. If we can't see the enemy already trying to set up his one world control and power, it's simply, and I'm not going conspiratorial. I'm just saying there's a conspiracy and it's a great, uh, it's from demon, it's from hell. I'm not saying everything that happens. We're going to go back to normal. We're going to go back to some normalcy in our world very soon. But we are being prepped and conditioned for that takeover. And whether it happens in our lifetime or our kids' lifetimes, it's going to happen. So it's time that we have our eyes open to this Babylon, Babylon this Babylonian, this Babylon, Babylon the great Babylon city, that's going to be the, the government or the beast system that is going to come up and bring control governmentally of the world. So I appreciate your time tonight. May God bless you. God's got his hand on you. We'll see you 1045 on Sunday morning uh, for our, our weekly worship service. And then we'll be back with you on Revelation chapter 18, uh, session 16. Uh, on Monday night at 6:30. So, Father, bless us. God, I pray that that um, you would you would you would touch our hearts. And anything that Cameron said that doesn't line up with your word, God, let us forget that. But God, everything that you said, would you let that hit people directly in our heart, God? Where we'll it'll cause change. It'll cause change. God, forgive us of our sexual perversion. God, forgive us of our pride. Forgive us of our arrogance that says we know something better than what the gospel says. God, forgive us for when we fall for the lies of the enemy. God, redeem us. God, bring us joy. 
Bring us holiness. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, thank you for coming. See you next time.